Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Able Voices Podcast. I'm Dr. Rhoda Bernard, Founding Managing Director of the Berkeley Institute for Arts, Education, and Special Needs, and I'm proud to present this podcast featuring disabled artists and arts educators. We are inviting artists with disabilities to be guest hosts for the Able Voices Podcast. Today, you'll meet our first guest host, jazz pianist and composer Matt Savage. Matt is on the autism spectrum. Matt will host our next couple of episodes where he will interview some disabled artists. Let me tell you a little bit about Matt Savage. Matt has had a professional career since childhood as a jazz musician, band leader, and composer. He has played with some of the biggest names in jazz, including Chick Corea, the Ellington All-Stars, Shaka Khan, Wynton Marsalis, and many more. He has recorded more than a dozen albums. He teaches at colleges in Boston and New Hampshire. He gives private piano lessons, and he gives master classes in English and Spanish. Welcome, Matt. We're delighted to have you as our first guest host of the Able Voices podcast. Thank you so much, Rhoda. I'm really excited to be here. I'd like to start off by asking you to tell us your story as a musician. How did you get your start as a musician, and how did you get from there to where you are today? Ooh, that's a good question. It's a pretty long story. Um, so, uh, so actually, when I was three years old, um, that's when I was first diagnosed with autism, and I actually had an aversion to um, loud sounds, including most um, musical audio, most musical uh, samples. So, um, so even though my mom uh, knew how to play some pieces on the piano for me. Um, I uh, didn't like most sounds in the outside world. So over the next uh, three to five years, I underwent a whole lot of intensive therapies, including auditory integration therapy. And then at age six is when I first discovered the piano and uh, it's been a part of my life ever since. I um, started classical piano at age six and, um, and then discovered jazz the next year. And then my journey to becoming a professional jazz musician, it was, uh, it was pretty sudden, I guess. Like I never really thought that uh, it was something I could do as a as a living, but but from the start, I understood the um, like I understood um, the uh, music and uh, the tonalities and the improvisations, and it um, and um, I really it really excited me. So it was a lot of fun playing, uh, not just playing piano, but improvising on piano as well. Now. In terms of discovering jazz, mostly I just liked it at the start because the songs were all so fast and long. Um, Like, I wasn't really thinking of feeling the music on any sort of higher level for a while. So that took a lot of time. But um, but initially, I remember at that age, I really wanted to be a mathematician. But um, but as soon as uh, as soon as I got used to playing the piano, I felt really comfortable doing it. And then after uh, playing public concerts, uh, both domestically and internationally over the next few years, um, that's when I really felt like I could be a musician full time. Wow. A couple of things about that I'd love to have you tell us more about. You are also a composer. You write a lot of music. How did that come about for you? That's a good question. I mean, um, when, of course, when musicians are improvising, they're always composing in real time, right? Sure. So um, I don't remember the idea of me composing music having any sort of specific gestation. Um, like it's always been a part of me. Like I would write quick eight bar exercises uh, pretty much the moment I knew how to uh, play pieces of similar difficulty on the piano. Wow. And uh, so it was always a lot of fun for me. And uh, I guess being a professional composer, a lot of that... Um, a lot of that really started with the writing of jazz lead sheets for my first jazz groups. You know, there's a whole lot you can do in 32 bars and um, like it doesn't feel quite as aggravating to write such a short uh, head or melody, if you will. Sure. Um, but um, like once I really started having these jazz heads written down, that's when I felt like uh, that's when I really felt comfortable composing. Like I could play these tunes uh afterward and not feel regretful or anything and just continue to be excited by the music. That's fantastic. You have also recorded something like 13 albums. 
I probably I'm probably behind the times. There's probably another one that's coming out tomorrow. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. So tell us about your your life as a recording musician. Yeah, my life as a recording musician. It started with a couple of local projects to um, raise money for autism research. So, um, and my mom really helped me a whole lot with uh, everything because I wouldn't have known how to navigate all of this myself. But, but yeah, you know, um, uh, you know, just being in the studio, um, it uh, took a little bit of getting used to. I mean, the uh, instruments are so nice, and the uh, and uh, there's no cavernous reverb everywhere, so it's uh, it feels overly comfortable, I guess. But um, but you know, it's recording the music has always been a part of um, who I am. And nowadays, of course, nowadays everybody has a recording set up at home. But but still, there's something special for me about being in the studio, just live collaboration with other musicians. And um, it's not quite as mainstream in the pop music world, but in the jazz world, you are expected to have the whole band recorded at the same time, mostly in one room, but also probably in a couple of isolation booths. Mm -hmm. And most of my recordings are full length albums. Although my latest project is uh, the Matt Savage Groove Experiments debut EP Splash Variations, which came out at the end of 2018. And uh, there's been a little bit of a pandemic hiatus since then, but the Groove Experiments going to go back into the studio in about a month. And, um, and then the um, and I'm planning to start recording a lot more and um, hopefully um, and trying to get the promotional campaign back up and running again. So I'm hoping uh, hoping to do a lot more performing over the next couple of years. That's fantastic. One more question about your music that I think people will find interesting. So here you are, you're six years old and you start classical piano and you're seven and you start jazz. You are collaborating when you start collaborating with other jazz players with people two, three, five times your age. Can you talk about what that's like or what that was like for you? Well, I, I never really thought of the age difference as being particularly jarring. I mean, I wasn't thinking from the audience's point of view though. So um, I just knew that I liked to play uh, bebop lines really fast. So mm -hmm. I wasn't particularly thinking of anything um, long term, I was more just having fun. But but I really have to hand it to the musicians who helped me um, carry along with this journey. So um, like the uh, original trio, we recorded uh, maybe five or six albums together. And um, there was John Funkhauser on bass who um, was just about to start uh, teaching at Berkeley. And um, and then Steve Silverstein on drums, who was teaching at the Rivers School in Weston, Mass. And um, yeah, and uh, even though both of them have uh, moved down south or southwest recently, um, I uh, I really have to con always give them a shout out for helping for help for the help they have uh, given me um, in be not just becoming a professional musician, but also becoming an adult in a world where it's tough to. Uh, understand everything that the grown-ups are saying. Absolutely. John Funkhauser and I go way, way back. We were students at NEC together. Um, and yes, he just moved to the Southwest. Great guy. Fabulous. Not only a great bass player, he's a wonderful pianist himself. Wonderful pianist. Yes. Um, his uh, trio and quartet records as a pianist are really lovely. They are. Um, you've got great taste in music too. Never mind great music that you play. Um, you alluded to this a little earlier, but I want to um, have you expand on your autism. You talked about how there was a lot of sound sensitivity when you were much younger, and there was a very intensive therapeutic period. Can you talk a little bit about what your autism was like for you when you were younger and similarly your journey to today? So, uh, of course, for the first seven or eight years of my life, I didn't even know what autism was. So. Um... It's kind of hard to ask a young child how they feel about the whole thing, but but short answer, I wasn't really thinking of my emotions in the long term about um, any sort of disability or sensitivity. I just knew like uh, like uh, sound loud or sound quiet, you know. Sure. Um, I was always I was always very skilled with um, 
reading and math um, around that time. But in terms of understanding what people were saying, I would not be listening. Um, so I do remember that really well. And then, of course, I was also gluten and dairy free before it was cool. So, um, <laughs> so that was a whole different angle. I mean, I always knew I was different, but I just uh, always assumed that um, people were thinking of each other more on a quantitative perspective, if that makes any sense, like in terms of uh, where what they do, where they live, what they're um, like, how well they did on a test. I wasn't really thinking of uh, developing a closer emotional relationship with people. But so um, I guess it was a little bit hard um, for me to um, understand that I should have interacted with other people in order to um, uh, in order to form a lasting connection. Really interesting. So mm -hmm. is there more you want to say about that, Matt? Well, I do remember like uh, learning that the uh, first couple of CDs were um, uh, projects for autism research. And of course, I and as a young kid, I thought only the stars recorded CDs. So I felt really excited about that. Sure. But yeah, you know, I guess um, I, I just remember there being a big jump in uh, perception on my part um, once the therapies really started. And also once I got more integrated into uh, elementary school around third grade. So that was a big turning point for you. That makes sense. Absolutely. I love a couple of things that you said. First of all, you said you were dairy and gluten free before it was cool. You were a lot of things before it was cool. You were playing uh -huh. music when you were six. Before You're like on the leading edge of cool all the time, which is very, very neat. Um, and then when you said about thinking of people on a quantitative level, almost like the facts, the demographics of a person rather than or instead of or only that as opposed to that plus the emotional connection element. Is that what, what I'm understanding? Absolutely. Cool. Um, so it's time to hear some music. So can you tell us a little bit about the, we're going to hear just an excerpt of one of your pieces. And can you tell us a little bit about what we're going to hear? Absolutely. So um, I'd like to uh, play one of my original pieces. Uh, this is from the Matt Savage Groove Experiments debut project, Splash Variations. And um, and uh, true to the album's title or the EP's title, um, there are two, two tunes in there called Splash and Splash in G Major. So... Um, this is the original Splash, also written as hashtag Splash. So um, it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit goofy in terms of its composition, but it's um it's a funk it's a little bit of a uh, of an instrumental funk sing along, sort of in the vein of the Headhunters or Blood, Sweat, and Tears or the Average White Band, all of those horn groups in the seventies, and the uh, entire lyrics are Splash. Great. So uh, I hope you enjoy this one. Terrific. Matt, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing that music with us. Uh, my next question for you is about your teaching. You are a performer and a composer, and you are also a teacher. Can you tell us about your teaching and the work that you do? Absolutely. Um, I'm uh, living a pretty busy life right now, teaching at a few different places. Um, I'm on the faculty of uh, Longy School of Music in uh, Longy School of Music of Bard College in Cambridge, Mass. Fantastic. And yes. um, and also Bunker Hill Community College, St. Anselm College, and uh, the Community Music Center of Boston. Wow. 
So in these positions, you know, I've been teaching mostly uh, piano lessons, but also some group piano classes and um, some choral accompanying. And, uh, and then this semester, for the first time, I'm co-directing the uh, spring musical theater production at Longy. So that's been fun. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yes, it is. So it's one of these existences where if it's Tuesday, I go to this place. If it's Wednesday, I go to this place kind of thing. Absolutely. Yes. And um, yeah, you know, a lot of us musicians, you know, we've had uh, we've um, we've been balancing part time teaching positions. Um, you know, our work is always so specialized and oftentimes based around a certain instrument. So um, so sometimes uh, so sometimes musician studios, they start off smaller and take a while to grow. But it's a it's a part of a it's a part of the uh, teaching and touring musicians life, you know. Um, we have our weekday commitments and our weekend commitments. And um, yeah, and then on the weekends, I've still had plenty of time to do gigs. Um, my gig schedule was um, pretty limited in the last two years, at least with the club dates, although I had a lot of private gigs too. But now that I'm recording again, I'm um, hoping to hit the road a little bit more as well. Fantastic. You'll have to keep us posted on where you're going to be. Definitely. Awesome. Before we hear the next piece that, we, that you're going to share with us, um, I would love to know what advice you would give for a musician who has a disability. Ooh, that's a big question. So, um, well, first of all, I would say that, um, that music is really a long-term commitment. You know, it gets very addictive, you know, um, not just practicing an instrument, but um, also the act of playing and being in a musician community. So... The, the, so the physical commitments of uh, being a musician, they can be pretty extreme, even if your disability does um, does not affect the mechanics of an instrument or voice, for example. So, um, so, so if you get really good at an instrument, like it's important to ask, like, um, uh, like is the music community where I really feel at home? And uh, for many of us, it is, you know, if... Uh, so many of us are lonely otherwise, and there's really nothing more fulfilling than being a creator and making stuff people are going to remember, you know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Really good advice. Thank you, Matt. Oh, you're very welcome. I know you have a second piece that you want to share an excerpt of with us. Can you tell us about what we're going to hear? Absolutely. So I picked a tune called Green from... Uh, my 2016 solo piano album, Matt Savage, Piano Voyages. So, um, and compositionally, I'm picking this one, not just because it's one of the highlights of the Piano Voyages album for me, but um, also because it's, uh, it's basically the opposite of Splash. Like Splash is, um, it's almost entirely based on one chord, plus a single word of lyrics, and it's more of a sing-along. But, but, you know, Green is... Uh, is the opposite. It's um, it's a very complex uh, uh, tune that shifts through a few keys, um, and um, and it it the texture reminds me a lot of one of my favorite pianists and composers, uh, Keith Jarrett. Mm, so um, and the form is really strange, but it's still. But I realized after composing it that it still adds up to a nice even uh, sixty four measures. So it ends up with a power of two in terms of its form length, as if nothing happened. Huh. But it's but I still tried to keep it melodic as it goes through um, these chord changes. So I hope you enjoy it. Before we hear it, I have to make one comment, which is you like long pieces with short titles. <laughs> I just was noticing at least the two we're hearing today have one word, one word, one syllable titles. <laughs> Oh yeah, I like short titles. I also like long ones like uh, A Fast Car in Summer. Oh, that's a nice title. Yep. Just pointing that out. Let's listen to Green.
mentioned a little bit about this already, but just so we can be super helpful for our listeners who are now going to want to follow you and know what you're up to. Can you tell us about your current projects and your plans for recording and touring? Absolutely. I actually haven't discussed this too much yet, but I'm starting to feel like it's time. You know, um, I have two current projects, the uh, Matt Savage Quartet um, featuring um, a great alto saxophonist, Mark Zaleski. And, um, and then um, the Matt Savage Groove Experiment, of course. Um, the Groove Experiments changed uh, the lineup a little bit since Splash Variations, but um, but we have our core uh, sextet now. It's in, So it's five of us instrumentalists and then our vocalist, Robbie Pate, on half the tunes. Great. So, um, so I've been, uh, been developing the sound over the last year or two and uh, played some occasional gigs, some online and uh, some in person with limited audiences. And um, so, and uh, I want these, the, so whenever uh, the projects um, of these bands finally come out on disc or uh, on the interwebs, if you will, I um, like, um, I really want them to re- represent um, like the full breadth and character of um, what I'm doing as a pianist now. So not necessarily empty virtuosity, but, um, but just, um, just a far wilder sound than, than, uh, than I'm used to, but also a more introspective and lyrical sound on the slow tunes, because I know we're all ready for some sort of big musical escape, you know? Absolutely. That's great. Um, so my last question for you is you're going to be the guest host of this podcast for its next two episodes. Can you tell us about the two people you will be interviewing? Very nice. Yes. Um, I'm uh, really happy to be, uh, interviewing these amazing musicians. Um, so, so next up is Wayne Piercy, this, uh, trumpeter who uh, also lives in Boston and, um, yeah, he's uh, he's uh, he was one of my classmates at Berkeley College of Music, although we never actually met then, um, which is pretty funny. And uh, he's he's been blind since birth, but he's one of the most amazing trumpet soloists I've ever heard, um, both in the uh, jazz idiom and the classical idiom. He, not only is he um, really skilled in bebop jazz, but also um, uh, historical natural trumpet and cornet. Wow! So. And I'm sure he's going to talk about all those different styles. Um, I've also recorded with him, too, on the uh, Piercy Gratzmiller Jazz Quintet's debut album, which is also a few years ago. And um, and then next, and then after that, um, uh, we're going to be interviewing Nick Guzman. He's a uh, singer on the autism spectrum and um, rock singer. He leads his own band singer songwriter type stuff. And we both played um, at a light up the blues concert uh, for autism awareness month in April, 2015 and Neil Young and uh, Stephen Stills were also at that concert that was in Los Angeles Wow! and uh, he's on the West coast now. So yeah. Great. Well, we can't wait to hear them and we can't wait to have you come back as our host. So I want to thank you, Matt, for taking the time to speak with us today. We are really looking forward to those next episodes. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Able Voices is a production of the Berkeley Institute for Arts, Education, and Special Needs, led by me, Dr. Rhoda Bernard, the founding managing director. It is produced by Daniel Martinez del Campo, The introduction music is by Kai Levin, and our closing song is by Sebastian Batista. Kai and Sebastian are students in the arts education programs at the Berkeley Institute for Arts Education and Special Needs. If you would like to learn more about our work, you can find us online at berkeley.edu slash B-I-A-E-S-N, or email us at B-I-A-E-S-N at berkeley, that's L-E-E, dot edu.